the United States is slowly starting to enter a very long and drawn out decline phase of its U.S. oil and gas industry. That's what we're going to talk about today. Got a lot of facts and data stuff to show you, things to talk about. Basically, you know, for the longest time, politicians and other people in the United States have given us a very comforting story about the oil and gas industry, how dominant we are, how energy independent we are, world's top producer, how we can drill our way out of anything, you know, all this stuff. That's That whole story is breaking down pretty quickly now. I'm not saying we're no longer going to be the world's top producer because the fact is there's oil basins all over the world that are entering decline phases. Oil production in the Permian Basin is declining for only the second time since the beginning of the Shell Revolution. The first time was because of COVID, a global pandemic. It wasn't a problem that was industry-related, that was business-related. Permian production is declining now, and it is directly industry-related and, and business-related. And soon we're going to see nationwide production drops. And I want you to consider something. Oil production in the Permian Basin declining for only the second time ever because oil's averaging, what, $58? Does that make sense? You could see it at $40 maybe, but $58? Here's another stat. In 2024, the Permian Basin completed a record number of wells and put a record number of wells online. The growth in production in the Permian Basin in 2024, where they set all those records, was lower than it was in 2023. We set records in the most prolific oil field in the world and had less production growth than the year prior. That is not good. So the truth is uncomfortable. But look, this isn't just about geology. It's also about policy, capital discipline. And a lot of it is about just denial colliding with reality. When we talk about bad energy policy, the Republican Party often talks about how hostile the Biden administration was from a regulatory perspective towards the oil and gas industry, claiming that they tried to destroy it. And Wall Street saw that. But the oil and gas industry had its best years. Under Joe Biden, it's its most record profits, its best years, by far. But what Wall Street also sees is the hostility from the Trump administration towards the oil and gas industry. And while Biden's policies could have been viewed as regulatory hostility, The Trump administration has price hostility towards the industry. Going to the Middle East, encouraging repeatedly OPEC to increase production and drive down prices in the United States. That is price host that is very hostile towards the US energy sector. That would be considered bad energy policy. And for over a decade, you know, we've had bad energy policy. We've had underinvestment in the industry. Rig counts are down. New wells are less productive, declining, flattening. Companies are quietly revising production guidance lower. All the best rock is gone. All the best places to drill are gone. 
the tier one acreage you may have heard me talk about, the sweet spots. That's that's drilled up. So what's left? The the lower producing wells with faster decline curves and higher costs per barrel. How do I know this? Because in 2024, the Permian Basin set a record and production growth dropped. And in 2025, with $58 oil, production is declining. It's pretty simple, okay? The Permian isn't collapsing, but it is aging. An aging shell doesn't forgive, especially political spin. Shell oil is, isn't like the old oil fields. It's like oil wells on a treadmill that's turned all the way up. Every single year, the wells decline sharply. Companies must drill constantly just to maintain the same production. Every new well produces less than the last. More drilling buys less oil. Capital efficiency is failing. And that's a very important part of this. The U.S. oil production is no longer about growth. It's about survival drilling. And, and the big player here is capital. You see, back in the old days, long ago, oil money was kind of separate from Wall Street money. Oil money came from oil men and other wealthy investors who, who just wanted to become billionaires. Well, now the capital that exists in the oil and gas industry is the capital that sits in the middle of Wall Street. They're not willing to take the risks that the old men of the old days were willing to. That's not a thing. And that's huge. Because the capital is voting against the politicians. Politicians love to say, well, companies are greedy. They won't drill. That's not what's happening. What's actually happening is investors are demanding cash flow. Shareholders are demanding capital discipline. Lenders don't trust policy stability, whether it's Democrat or Republican. A Democrat comes in, he appears to be hostile from a regulatory standpoint. Republican comes in, he's hostile from a price standpoint. So after years of all of this hostility, capital is saying, you know, we're done funding growth that all the politicians want to attack. We can put our money anywhere. We're not married to oil. These, these people aren't the oil men of the 60s and 70s that were going to either live or die by a barrel of oil. These are people with money that can put it anywhere they want. And you can't threaten an industry and expect them to, or act shocked when they stop expanding. But the problems in the Permian Basin aren't unique to the Permian Basin. The Bakken, very mature. It's infrastructure constrained, very high decline rates. You have the Eagleford, very mature. Limited expansion zones, lots of older wells. The Anadarko, the Neobrara, the DJ Basin all have higher break-evens, all have more regulatory pressure. You put all that together, and it's, it's pretty clear that the U.S. shale machine is losing momentum everywhere all at once. There is no next Permian Basin. There is no backup plan, except maybe Venezuela. And this is where politics gets dangerous. 
Declining U.S. oil production means quite a few things. It means there's less cushion against global supply shocks. There's more pricing power for OPEC. OPEC is currently taking market share from us at the request of Donald Trump. More leverage for Russia. More risk of price spikes. And when all that happens, the politicians, they're not going to blame the declining EURs or, you know, years of underinvestment or hostile policy. They'll blame the oil companies or the speculators or foreign producers. The cycle will just repeat. You know, the energy transition was sold as a replacement, but in reality, it's kind of became an excuse. An excuse to underinvest in oil, to delay infrastructure projects, to pretend supply didn't matter, but oil demand hasn't disappeared. It's only grown. It shifted slowly while supply was politically discouraged. That's how you get tight markets and volatility and affordability crises. Physics doesn't care about press releases. We are entering a time where the geology is tightening, the capital is more disciplined than ever, the policy is as hostile as it's ever been, no matter who's in office, and production growth is, is fading. We're not running out of oil. We're running out of the easy oil and pretending, you know, otherwise. So what are we going to end up with? We're going to end up with higher prices and less security and likely zero credibility. What I'm saying is in the future, the very near future, the break-even prices for oil production in the United States are going to be so high that we're only going to experience growth in, in times of, what, $70, $80 oil? That's in the future. And not far off in the future. We're only going to experience growth in times of, you know, gas approaching $4 a barrel. Because what's going to happen, or $4 a gallon, what's going to happen as production declines in the United States, they're not going to stop exporting refined fuels. It's very lucrative. Refined fuel markets in the U.S. are going to tighten up. Gas prices are going to rise, even if oil prices don't rise that much. And this is going to be a, a very long process, right? This isn't something that's going to happen overnight. It's not something that's going to happen in six months. But that's only because that break-even price of oil, where the price of oil is right now, is it's just right there on that line where you can still justify some drilling and cancel other drilling. But one thing that's for sure is in the future, I don't know how long it'll be. That's This is really going to be up to OPEC. But in the future, we're going to... I don't think it's going to be that far in the future. Maybe a year. I think we could really start to see high oil prices. It depends on how much production declines in the United States. And you know this ties to Venezuela. If $58 oil 
causes production to, to decline in the most prolific oil field in the world, the Permian Basin. That is really bad. That, it, I mean, there are other oil fields in the world that can produce at significantly lower prices than the Permian Basin. That's bad. When you mix that with the, the capital discipline that oil companies are, are adhering to now, with all the capital being so closely tied to financial markets and Wall Street, none of that is a recipe for oil dominance by the United States. I will say all that to say, Natural gas is going to be fine. Natural gas is going to be fine. <laughs> it's a totally different animal. But this shale oil revolution, as we have decided to call it for so many years, uh, is nearing its end. It's been a great run. And it's we're still going to produce a lot of oil for a long time. But the best days are, are way behind us. That is apparent for sure. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Really appreciate my new followers and subscribers. Please like and share. Thank you guys so much.